Mesdames et Messieurs, ladies and gentlemen, the Queen. Queen. Notwithstanding your uh, enthusiastic applause, uh, the President and I wish to announce that uh, we won't be singing any more songs. <laughs> <laughs> Please be seated. Monsieur le Président, Madame Reagan, chers amis, en nous répartissant l'Amérique du Nord, l'histoire a signé pour nous un pacte d'amitié. Les lois de la nature, de l'économie, de nos sécurités réciproques et de la morale de nos peuples nous prédestinent au dialogue et à la solidarité. La convergence de nos intérêts a tissé entre nous d'innombrables circuits d'échanges économiques scientifique et culturel. Votre présence pèse d'un tel poids dans notre vie nationale qu'elle ne laisse pas de susciter parfois de légitimes appréhensions sur la préservation de notre identité. L'indépendance ne trouve pas nécessairement son compte dans l'interdépendance. Le Canada, pays souverain et indépendant, se reconnaît comme premier devoir de veiller à ses intérêts nationaux 
tout en s'efforçant d'établir des relations harmonieuses avec ses alliés à travers le monde. Vous et moi savons, Monsieur le Président, que la profondeur d'une amitié, qu'elle fleurisse entre deux hommes ou encore entre deux peuples, se mesure à ses œuvres et à sa capacité de surmonter les écueils qu'elle rencontre sur la route. La nôtre n'échappe pas à ses alliés. Les problèmes que nous avons à régler mettent bien sûr à l'épreuve les relations privilégiées que nous avons toujours entretenues. Mais de notre côté, la franchise et la bonne volonté, qui sont l'apanage de l'amitié, nous seront d'un puissant concours dans l'élaboration et la mise en œuvre de solutions adéquates. Mon gouvernement entend miser sur notre entente et les idéaux qui nous sont communs. Nous sommes un pays qui n'a jamais cessé de se montrer vigilant dans la défense et la promotion des droits démocratiques et qui ne fera jamais à quiconque fonde sa politique sur la poursuite de la paix. Oui, paix et respect des libertés démocratiques, voilà les champs que nous proposons à l'épanouissement de notre amitié. Our meetings, Mr. President and friends, mark a new era in relations between Canada and the U.S. We represent two sovereign democracies. Our people share friendships, interests, and associations which are unmatched by any two nations in history. But our people know that these opportunities on the continent can be realized only by cooperation. That there are problems on this continent for which the only strategy is a common strategy and the only solution is a joint solution. Our people expect us to deal with these problems together. We are expected to deliver And I believe, Mr. President, we have begun to do so. Our people know that a bigger and better trade relationship between us and the wider world means more new job opportunities on both sides of the border. We have concluded a major trade declaration which will send a strong signal to all who share our commitment. Our declaration will enrich what is already the most significant and extensive trade relationship by far in the world. This joint declaration is a strong statement of intent But we have gone further. We have resolved some trade issues today and set out a program for resolving others. We have also today concluded an agreement enabling us to upgrade a key element in our unique defense partnership, and this, I believe, is both helpful and important to our both countries. It provides a state-of-the-art warning system in North America to strengthen deterrence. It adds to our mutual security and is based on the principle of mutual respect for sovereignty. We're going to sign a treaty on legal assistance to improve cooperation in criminal investigations in regard to the suppression of international narcotics trafficking and organized crime. And this afternoon, we will exchange instruments of ratification on a salmon treaty, which is very important to Canada and to British Columbia, and which has taken us 15 years to conclude. To so give you an, an indication of its importance, I suppose, to both countries. And we have agreed to do more in space and most significantly, to preserve the space that we have. La conscience que nous avons de nos responsabilités communes envers la protection de l'environnement et les gestes que nous avons commencé à poser me donnent la certitude de la capacité de nos deux pays à imaginer, à mettre en vigueur dans un esprit de partnership des solutions aux problèmes des puits acides et des déchets toxiques. Mr. President, the talks between the United States and the Soviet Union, which opened in Geneva a few days ago, addressed the most awesome challenge of our time. There is no greater issue of importance to the Canadian people or to the world than that. We know that our role in the world is not that of a superpower, but Canada is a veteran of two world wars in Korea. We have acquired our national sovereignty honorably in important measure through the enormous sacrifice of generations of Canadians who with genuine courage and in many cases with their very lives, spoke for our unshakable commitment to freedom, our unquenchable belief in democracy. Having thus acquired our independence, we shall surrender no part of it at any time or in any circumstance. We have been a member of almost every peacekeeping expedition in the history of the UN. We are vigorous members of the NATO and NORAD partnerships. We have special associations of language and culture, of aid and trade and development around the world. We are taking part in all the multilateral forums in peace. We have paid our dues in full, and we have as much at stake 
as any other nation in those issues, which are quite literally matters of life and death for all peoples. Canadians would not have us spectators on this, the most vital issue of our time. As I indicated to Mr. Gorbachev in Moscow last Thursday and to you, Mr. President, today, Canadians expect their government to use all opportunities to help bring the world down from the nuclear mountain, away from confrontation, and closer to a durable peace. We shall follow this policy wherever it leads, knowing that every advance along this road is worthy of the greatest effort. We encourage and support you and your delegates, Mr. President, and those of the Soviet Union in the search for peace. You carry, you carry with you our hopes and our prayers. Mr. President, Canada and the United States are different, nor is this more striking to an American, I suppose, than here in Quebec City, the heart of French-speaking Canada. We have our differences, but Mr. President, we have much in common. You personify the success and accomplishment of today's America with an easy grace, clear courage, and warm good humor. You have reignited confidence and pride in your great nation. That is good for America and good for her friends and allies around the world. You have emphasized, Mr. President, that governments draw strength from the spiritual values and the dignity of their people. Such a nation is a worthy leader of the free world. Such a nation is a good friend, a good neighbor, and a trusted ally. Together, Mr. President, we have an opportunity to set a compelling and eloquent example to the world of friendship, harmony, in this, and peace. In that spirit, I ask our colleagues and friends here today to join with me in drinking to your continued good health, to that of your wonderful wife, and to the success of your second term. May it be all, Mr. President, all that you hope and pray and resolve it to be for your countrymen and for all God's children. Mesdames et Messieurs le Président des États-Unis, ladies and gentlemen, our wonderful friend, the President of the United States of America. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're very kind. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Prime Minister. Mrs. Mulroney, Mayor Peltier, and all of you very distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Nancy et moi désirons vous remercier du fond du cœur de votre chaleureuse hospitalité. <laughs> Just as four years ago, it is an honor and a privilege to make our first visit of the term a visit to Canada, our close neighbor, our strong ally, and yes, our dear friend. To have come to the heart of old Quebec, to this chateau that for us will forever be a memory of beauty, looking down on beauty all around, and still more to have been joined by one who shares my roots on St. Patrick's Day, well, it's almost too much for this son of an Irishman to bear. <laughs> As you might say in your native tongue, c'est formidable. <laughs> and uh, this might be enough to convince you that French is not my native tongue. <laughs> uh, 
Actually, I was told a long time ago, don't worry about your accent. It's not how well you speak French, the gentleman said, but how well you appreciate our people and culture. And ever since Jacques Cartier told me that, I've been a great admirer of all things French-Canadian. <laughs> As we begin anew, we come again to be with friends. We come to share great dreams in a land where big is a word too small to describe the sweep of Laurentian peaks and prairie plains or the strength of Canadian spirit that tamed a giant continent and now looks to a future rich with promise. Flying over Canada yesterday afternoon, I thought of your commander, Marc Garneau. He's the first of what we hope will be many Canadian astronauts on joint space shuttle missions. And aboard the space shuttle Challenger at a moment high above Quebec, Commander Garneau said, my country is very fantastic. We are lucky to be Canadian, to have such a big and wonderful country. But to which I would only add, and are we not lucky to be neighbors in these good free lands that God has blessed as none others have ever been blessed. When we look around the world today, when we see a scar of shame dividing families in Europe east from west and in Korea north from south, see the anguish that aggression has wrought upon so many innocent lives across our planet, then yes, we would do well to give thanks for the principles of democracy and human dignity that have cradled us with peace and showered us with abundance since the birth of our two nations. Victor Hugo once observed, no army can stop an idea whose time has come. Well, today the tide of freedom is up, lifting our economies ever higher on new currents of imagination, discovery, and hope for our future. There is a leader who personifies this new spirit, who has said, Canadians in the mid-80s have a renewed sense of confidence in themselves as a nation. There is a role for government that is less interventionist. He said, a role that creates a climate in which the entrepreneurial genius of the private sector can do what it does best, namely create new wealth, new possibilities of employment. We take a friendly neighbor's quiet pride in your campaign revival, and we share your great respect for the man doing so much to carry it forward. Your Prime Minister and my friend, Brian Mulroney. Canadians live at the top of North America, and sometimes we think of you as fellow home dwellers inhabiting the upper floors of the house, and we who live downstairs have heard some rumbling up here in that portion that we know to be Quebec. The changes in French Canada during the past 25 years, your Revolution Tranquille, propelled the transformation of Quebec into a modern community while emphasizing all along its French-speaking character. In a unique referendum, the people of Quebec declared themselves Canadian and Québécois. Now your long history as a French-speaking North American community is entering an exciting phase. Quebec entrepreneurs competing across the continent, spreading business know-how with a French face. We see and feel your progress and we value highly the friendship of a people unafraid to embrace the challenge of change, yet unwilling to forsake your oldest, most trusted companions, Canadian traditions, values, and roots. There's a saying I've always liked, one should keep old roads and old friends. You have not strayed from the road of Canadian culture, from those good and graceful virtues that enrich your lives and keep you free to be kind and true, free to strive for progress and greatness without surrendering your souls to a mad and mindless pursuit of the material. Mes amis, 
The eyes of all America are on Canada. In our universities, new programs for Canadian studies have been created. In our government, new importance given to the Canadian-American relationship. And in our economy, we feel Canada's heightened presence in our daily lives. From Quebec, electrical power, to Alberta's oil and natural gas, and from your help in building our telecommunications industry to what many believe is the best beer in the world. <laughs> We're with you, Mr. Prime Minister. We feel mighty grateful for Canada, and we always will. At the heart of my nation's policies is one conviction, and please hear it well. No relationship is more important than the United States to the United States than our ties with Canada. We are by far each other's most important trading partner. Our two-way trade, the largest in the world, is valued at over $100 billion. We are allies in North America and across the North Atlantic. We are proud to stand watch with you, and together we shall keep our people free, secure, and at peace. Above all, we are friends, and friends we shall always be. The The question is, having righted ourselves and regained our optimism, where do we go from here? Well, I believe your Prime Minister and I agree. Canada and America can invest together, grow together, and lead together. And leaders, we shall be in a new partnership pointing toward the 21st century. That new partnership begins with our being more mindful of our need for close cooperation and constant communication each of us carefully respecting the other's interests and sovereignty. For our part, the United States has begun a great change in direction, away from years of creeping socialism and ever greater dependency that slowed our progress toward a new American revolution, a peaceful revolution to be sure, rising from our conviction that successful action must begin with a vision of hope and opportunity for all. The evidence is clear. Freedom works. Incentives are key. And nations ignoring these principles will lose out in the economic competition in the 1980s and beyond. Japan, a devastated country after World War II, cut tax rates almost every year for two decades, producing an explosive, non-inflationary expansion, making them a world economic power, and leaving Europe and North America falling behind. Other Pacific nations have also become champions for growth. Let us then set our sights on a new vision, a renaissance of growth in a world come alive with entrepreneurial vigor. Each nation trading freely with its neighbors, all of us together a mighty freedom tide carrying hope and opportunity to the farthest corners of the globe. We in the States have tried to learn from our mistakes and show once again that nothing succeeds like freedom. Since our tax rate reductions took effect, we have enjoyed 27 straight months of economic growth and a record 7 million jobs, producing a dramatic increase in our purchases from other nations, starting with Canada. We know we must do much more to restrain the growth of government, break down barriers of trade, and become more competitive. And since tax rates, functioning as prices for producing, saving, and investing, are the keys to economic growth or decline, we're committed to an historic reform of our tax code, making America's after-tax rewards the brightest light for growth and stability in the industrialized world. Protecting the environment is one of paramount concern to us both. The United States has the strictest auto emission standards in the world, and during the last decade, we spent over $150 billion to comply with our Clean Air Act. Emissions of sulfur dioxide are down nearly 30 percent, and nitrogen oxides are declining as well. But we must make further progress, and by acting reasonably and responsibly, we can and we will. Yesterday, the Prime Minister and I issued a statement on our agreement to address together the problem of acid rain. 
In all that we do, we seek to go forward with Canada as our partner, two leaders for progress through shared vision and enlightened cooperation. This afternoon at the Citadel, Prime Minister Mulroney and I will take further steps together to put our new partnership to work. We will issue a declaration on international security and sign a memorandum on the modernization of our North American air defense system. We will exchange the instruments of ratification that will bring the Pacific Salmon Treaty into effect, as he told you. We will sign a mutual legal assistance treaty, which will aid law enforcement authorities in both our countries. And we will issue a declaration on trade. The prosperity of Canada and the United States depends upon freer flowing trade within this continent and across the seas. We stand ready to improve further the Canada-U.S. trading relationship and to work with you to initiate a new multilateral trade round in early 1986. Mr. Prime Minister, I'm confident there isn't an area where you and I cannot reach an agreement for the good of our two countries. Come to think of it, maybe there is one. I know it's a great concern to you, but I don't think I have the authority to send Gary Carter back to the Expos. <laughs> <laughs> but more powerful in our economies, more powerful in our friendship, the United States and Canada can meet together the challenge of defending freedom and leaving a safer world for those who will follow. For more than 35 years, we and our European friends have joined together in history's most successful alliance, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. The world will not forget that Canada was in the forefront of the nations that formed and armed NATO. Upgrading NATO's conventional forces is essential to deterrence. The greater our ability to resist Soviet aggression with conventional forces, the less likely such aggression will ever occur. NATO is engaged in a rebuilding program, and today I want to thank publicly Prime Minister Mulroney and the Canadian people for your commitment to enhance your contribution to NATO's conventional forces and our overall defenses. Your deficit as a percentage of gross national product is bigger than ours, but you understand that protecting freedom is government's primary responsibility, and we salute Canadian wisdom and Canadian courage. The United States will continue to pursue the arms control talks in Geneva with determination, flexibility, and patience. It is our deepest conviction that a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. We must not rest in our search for a safer world dedicated to eliminating nuclear weapons with technology providing ever greater safety, not ever greater fear. We're enthusiastic about the research done so far on our strategic defense initiative. The possibility of developing and sharing with you technology that could provide a security shield and someday eliminate the threat of nuclear attack. It is for us the most hopeful possibility of the nuclear age, and we very much appreciate Canada's support on SDI research. You know, it puzzles me to hear the Soviets describe research to protect humanity as a threat to peace. Their protests ring a little hollow. I did some research of my own and found that in 1967, former Soviet Premier Alexei Kosygin said, the anti-missile system is not a weapon of aggression or attack. It is a defensive system. And the Soviets took his words to heart and began investing heavily in strategic defense. Let us all acknowledge that humanity will be far better served by moving away from offensive nuclear systems that kill people to non-nuclear defensive systems that protect the Geneva Convention, banning use of chemical weapons, SALT II limiting development of new weapons, and the ABM Treaty, but are now violating all three. And they signed the Helsinki Accord solemnly pledging respect for human rights but then jailed the individuals trying to monitor it in the SSR. Arms control is not the only issue on the East-West agenda, and the opening of the Geneva talks is not the only development in East-West relations. 
In most of our Western countries, our peoples can look forward to continue strong, stable governments, and our alliances are in good shape. We have demonstrated unity and firmness in our dealings with the East. We are ready to work with the Soviet Union for more constructive relations. We all want to hope that last week's change of leadership in Moscow will open up new possibilities for doing this. There's plenty to talk about in arms control, on regional issues, on human rights, and in our bilateral relations. My representatives in Moscow had good talks with Mr. Gorbachev, and Prime Minister Mulroney has given me his own assessment of the new Soviet leadership. If the Soviets are as ready as we are to take the other side's concerns into account, it should be possible to resolve problems and reduce international tensions. Let us always remain idealists, but never blind to history. Each of us, I would agree, I suspect that our lives grow richer and fuller as we help make other lives more secure and more free. We must never doubt the great good that Canada and the United States can accomplish together. Never doubt for a moment our journey toward a world where someday all may live under freedom's star, free to worship as they please, to speak their thoughts, to come and go as they will, to achieve the fullness of their potential, and yes, reach out to comfort those who have fallen with the godly gift of human love. This is the idealist within us whose heart is pure and can power our journey with faith and courage. But the realist must be there, too. Our navigator at the helm, whose eagle eyes discern each movement of the sky above and waves below. We must never stop trying to reach a better world, but we'll never make it if we don't see our world as it truly is. We cannot look the other way when treaties are violated, human beings persecuted, religions banned, and entire democracies crushed. We cannot ignore that while Canadians and Americans have donated nearly a hundred million dollars from their own pockets to help feed starving Ethiopians, the Soviets and all their satellites have given almost no aid, but they continue to provide more than a half a billion dollars a year in military supplies that the Ethiopian government is using against its own people. These are painful realities, but history may well remember them as the birth pangs of a new, much brighter era. Brave men and women are challenging the Brezhnev doctrine that insists once a country has been taken from the family of free nations, it may never return. Freedom movements are rising up from Afghanistan to Cambodia, Angola, Ethiopia, and Nicaragua. More than twice as many people are fighting in the field right now against the Nicaraguan communist regime as fought against Somoza. The weight of the world is struggling to shift away from the dreary failures of communist oppression into the warm sunlight of genuine democracy and human rights. Will history speak of freedom victorious? May we someday salute new heroes from nations reborn, sons and daughters who might grow up to be like a Marc Garneau or Roberta Bondar, bringing honor to science and their nations, or perhaps like Andre Vichet, who lost the use of his legs but with his will of steel in a land of the free, could keep on going to open six stores, employing more than 40 people, many of them handicapped, and even win our Boston Marathon as well. History's verdict will depend on us, on our courage and our faith, on our wisdom and our love. It'll depend on what we do or fail to do for the cause of millions who carry just one dream in their hearts, to live lives like ours in this special land between the seas where each day a new adventure begins in a revolution of hope that never ends. You know, Prime Minister Mulroney once suggested that Americans and their president should be grateful for Canada. How can we not be grateful for the greatness of Banting and Best, of Mike Pearson, of young Steve Fagno, and of so many we never knew? For the inspiration you give, for the success that you enjoy, and for the friend of America and friend of freedom that you will always be, yes, we say, thank God for Canada. And I ask you now.
And I ask you now to raise your glass with me to the Queen of Canada and to my good friend, the Prime Minister, Brian Mulroney. Thank you and God bless you.